I think, well, we're seeing a lot of that, I think, with uh, as artists began to explore three-dimensional uh, virtual reality type of scenarios, right? There, there, there's a trick that's being done there that is based in the materials that it's built around, but also on the computing power to create simulations of things that would be uh, physically impossible to make, uh, mm -hmm. but by understanding the, the neurology neuro of, of, of human vision and vision perception and, and oral perception as well, you can create these new environments um, in different ways. Hey everyone, welcome to It's a Material World. We're the show that uncovers why material science will change the world. Consider subscribing and hitting the like button down below. It would really help us out a lot. Also, we created a free career development guide for MSCs, which you can access using the link in the description. Now let's get on to the episode. Our sponsor today is Johnson Matthey, a global leader in sustainable technology. Johnson Matthey's vision is for a world that's cleaner and healthier today and for future generations. Johnson Matthey's scientists use their deep understanding of materials, surface science, chemistry, and chemical engineering to design catalysts, advanced materials, and processes, tackling the world's biggest challenges, such as reaching net zero, enabling cleaner air, improving health, and using our planet's natural resources more efficiently. Johnson Matthey, inspiring science, enhancing life. Special thanks to Matt Match for sponsoring this episode. Hi, everyone. Today's guest is Dr. Jane Cook, an inter- and transdisciplinary innovator an educator in material science and engineering and art. She's had extensive experiences researching and developing industrial processes for glasses, semiconductors, metals, and ceramics, while also fulfilling her passion for art through her time as a chief scientist in the Corning Museum of Glass, as a museum director at Penn State, and by making sculptures and other forms of art in her personal time. We are super excited to uncover the vast overlap between material science and art in this episode. So thank you so much for joining us, Jane. My pleasure. Thank you for reaching out. This will be fun. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, just uh, kind of starting as going. When we were younger, there's a perceived binary of science and art. Either you do science, like biology and chemistry, or you do art, like um, all sorts of different plays and actual art, but in reality, there's a deep intersection between the two of these. So can you talk about that intersection in more detail and specifically how we can apply it to material science? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, the, the, the idea of this separation of science from art is something that really got started in the 19th century um, as a really as, as a way of making more, more, more efficiently making good scientists and good engineers. Uh, you, you know that uh, you don't in, in your four year curriculum or five year curriculum as an undergrad, you have to really just kind of knuckle down and, and become the beginnings of the expert that in, you think industry wants you to be. Um, but at the same time, there's aspects to that, uh, to, to, to the value that scientists and engineers can bring to the world that has to do with their creativity and their free thinking ability and their, their, their uh, ability to uh, to fail passionately and learn from it and move forward. And uh, that's kind of been taken out of the curriculum uh, for the most part. Uh, what, what art and science have in common is at that, co is at that deep core that to, to, when, you, when, you're, when you're being inventive, when you're really not just kind of going through the scientific method hypothesis on through, you actually have to generate the hypothesis from somewhere. And where that usually comes from is from playing and from uh, just messing around and giving yourself a chance to, to pu pu push at the borders of things. And uh, artists and scientists do that in equal measure uh, as they're coming up with their ideas and as they're exploring what it is they're going to make. The real difference only comes in the, uh, in the focus. The scientist, the engineer has particular specs or a particular research plan, and the artist is responding to their own inner need to uh, express something about how they feel about the world or themselves. So they become their own uh, their own customer in some, in, to some extent. Wow. Yeah, I remember thinking about this and I remember like there were conversations about using like different parts of your brain for like science versus art, like creativity versus logic. But I, I always mm -hmm. thought, you know, why not practice developing like both sides or and like you could unlock so much more with with that. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, the, the, that that integration, right brain, left brain. Uh, 
if you look like historically, somebody like Leonardo da Vinci, who was a masterful artist, but also a brilliant uh, futurist and engineer, uh, because of the ability to be a, a Renaissance person, uh, we, we need to reclaim that. Um, we need to find ways to, uh, to, to, to raise the, that, that interest in uh, the creative for the creative sake, but also for the sake of you know, mental health is an important part of it. Um, and how, how to do that in terms of while still graduating in four years, getting <laughs> everybody has to double degree. I, I don't know what the answer to that is in terms of programming, but I certainly always uh, encourage uh, young scientists, young engineers, even uh, STEM K-12, you know, when you're coming up through, uh, through uh, high school to you know, be in musical theater, get into band, take a shop class, do something, have hobbies outside of your, your math science uh, core classes, just to be a good human. Uh, ultimately, that being informed, whether, whether you're a quote unquote good artist or not, uh, it's something that humans have done for tens of thousands of years that has been essential. And uh, I think it can only be of, of benefit to give yourself that kind of outlet in some way. Absolutely. Yeah. And so I know you mentioned um, in our previous discussion, the the idea that artists are materials engineers and we see all around us, whether it's sculptures or paintings or anything. I mean, they're made of materials, sometimes different materials, um, but they just practice in a different way. Artists versus traditional, I guess, materials engineers and engineering firms. So I guess what exactly did you mean by that? And can you discuss the similarities between the two roles? Sure. Yeah. So when we think about uh, kind of first defining a little bit, uh, when I think of a scientist and an engineer, I, they're, they're two different things, although uh, if, if it, they often they overlap in an individual, especially in the material sciences and engineering. Um, I, I think of science as sort of the pursuit of decimal places. It's the pursuit of precision, uh, <laughs> of understanding, and, and where, where the goal isn't necessarily to get an answer, it's to find the next question. That's what scientists and science is about. Engineering is no kidding about finding an answer and also finding out how many decimal places you actually need to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. um, I like to use the example of pi that uh, you, know, we, you might <laughs> me memorize it to be nerdy, uh, uh, 3.14159263857, blah, blah, blah. Uh, <laughs> but rarely do you actually ever need to know that more than three, <laughs> 3.14 mm -hmm. maybe. Um, and if in the material sciences and even a lot of mechanical stuff, you don't really need to know very many digits, but, but it's because it, precision is expensive when you're an engineer and you're actually designing something, uh, the difference between, uh, you know, a, a machine shop give, delivering you a piece of, of metal for a, for a machine that's uh, tolerance of 10 thousandths of an inch versus, you know, a few hundred thousandths of an inch that can make the difference of thousands and thousands or even millions of dollars on a machine. So you have to be very careful about taking, keeping track of how many decimal places you have. Um, so the, the focus of that engineering is, it, is understanding your constraints, um, understanding the opportunity, and then looking at what the situation is and picking what are the right materials, the right processes, the right, uh, you know, the, the right, right way to bring these things together uh, so that it's mechanically robust or optically active or whatever, you, whatever your, your application is. For an artist, again, sort of to, in defense of my, my hypothesis, uh, <laughs> artists uh, really do the same sort of thing, except mostly their, their specifications that they're responding to, as I mentioned before, sort of these internal specifications. Um, artists have this dilemma that, uh, that sort of matches the, the, this uh, uh, pursuit of precision of if, if when you're making a painting, if you one brush stroke too many and the painting is ruined. Uh, there, there, is, there is an answer, there is a final point, and it's the artist's uh, duty, burden, opportunity to both be in charge of when it's done, but also having to be in charge of when it's done. Uh, so, and, and all the principles that we learn in materials science and engineering about uh, specifying a material for all the different attributes for strength and, and optics and, you know, uh, formability, malleability, durability in various environments, all those things have to be considered as you're in pursuit of some aesthetic specification as opposed to a purely technical manufacturing specification. 
So again, it's just sort of turning that, what the, the art science thing on its head and really saying, you know, here are these people who are using those principles, making those same sorts of decisions uh, with, uh, with consequences that are, you know, the consequences of the heart, the consequences of the mind and the expression of, of the human condition. That, that's, that's as much of a burden in its own way as making sure the bridge doesn't fall down. Taking a step back, if we look at like an example, it could be like bio-inspired design. So that could potentially be an argument for both an artistic and a engineering combining to take a new step forward. Uh, and when we look at nature, we look at things like the Fibonacci sequence, where we see these very ordered mathematical scientific things occur in nature that we can then replicate in both art to look more realistic, but also in design. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's like the purest form of the artists and material engineers practicing in different ways? Or do you think we can go even farther beyond that point um, where we can combine the artistic vision and the engineering pursuit for definity um, to a farther point? Yeah, I, 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 it's a great question. I, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to, like off the top of my head, say, yeah, that's, that's, the, that's, that's number one. Mm -hmm. um, but I can say that um, artists know about this and, and they feel it. Sometimes they feel it in their bones and sometimes like me, they're sort of crossover disciplinary who, who, who are so turned on by the beauty of science uh, that that then becomes part of the foundation of what they express. Um, I mentioned like the Fibonacci sequence or the golden ratio, um, it, it, those, those principles of visual design or, or of, 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 of uh, biological design um, actually underpin the principles of design of, of like when you're doing graphic arts um, and when you're uh, putting together even, even a painting, the, the, the golden ratio and the Fibonacci spiral are all over Renaissance art. And on, I, I challenge you, you, you actually can find a Fibonacci spiral on a box of a breakfast cereal because the way that you compose a painting or a picture of any sort so that the human perception of it is, uh, we perceive it as beautiful or balanced or whatever the, the, the term you use, uh, really relates back to, the, back to human evolution in that the lowest frequency, the lowest risk way for us to understand and absorb information about the environment is the thing that we're going to perceive as the most beautiful. Orderliness is low risk. And, and so if we, we, when we create design work, again, whether it's the Mona Lisa or a box of, of Cracker Jack, you, you, the, you will spend less energy on intaking the data if the data is presented in a way that humans have evolved in order to perceive the lowest path, which is a Fibonacci spiral, five-fold uh, patterning. All these things are, are absolutely ingrained in us. And so when artists can take that understanding from the sciences and be intentional with it, whether it's uh, just sort of making it so their design is good, but also even like taking that idea and making that idea of the scientific idea part of the artwork itself, uh, yeah, that takes that takes things to the next level for a lot of artists, and uh, it's been my pleasure over the last ten years to really engage with members of the arts community and be that be that science bridge for them to help them understand uh, what it is they're doing, whether it's in you know, mostly working with glass artists, but uh, with others uh, to help them understand what what in the material can take them to the next level, what in the science can take them to the next level. So, since you have that blend of experiences in science and art. I was just wondering, do you see like the golden ratio or Fibonacci sequence? Do you notice that in the art that you see every day? Or is it, I guess, it's more subconscious? I see it, I, I see it everywhere. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I see. So just like looking at, at my, my, my zoom screen right now, if I go a little bit off center, that's actually uh, a, a better composed picture. It's uh, more exciting to the eye because you sort of see the out here and then it kind of comes in and actually finds my eye, but you have content off here, you have a lack of content over here, and it helps to draw the eye in to see it. But when you're right dead center, it's just, it, it, it gets tiresome to always be kind of looking right in the center. So you really wanna be there a little more casually off to one side. <laughs> so that, that, that's, my, that's my burden is that I see, I, see, I see art and the science, I see science and the art, and I can't, luckily I can't decouple them for, for my benefit and for my employers. <laughs> yeah, I remember thinking back to 
art classes and it's like the rule of thirds that's that's what this reminded me of um <laughs> yeah <laughs> absolutely cool and then from the artist perspective i know this is different with an engineer you kind of know when your project is done when you've like solved the problem um i remember hearing a story about how um there's an artist and and his friend and so when the artist was like um like working on a piece the friend was like oh that's beautiful that's perfect like you just you got to stop but he just kept going kept going and every single time the friend was like oh no no he, you made the right decision you had to keep going that was a really important piece is that something you see um like how do you learn to know when to stop yeah this this gets back to a really important principle of materials engineering process engineering uh, particularly mm. is you can't really understand when you've succeeded uh, in a in say in process engineering until you've spent enough time failing. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we talk about the process window, right? That, that this here is the space where we can hit our specifications with the right amount of product at low cost, and we we you know we're we're going to we're going to try and hold the center, but we know we can veer you know, in various, very in variable space in different directions and still come to where we're going to go. But the only way that you, and, and that makes for a more robust process, right? If you have some freedom to tune and some freedom for things to go out, out and still be good. And you actually, by doing that type of experiment where you let your machine run out of spec and then how do you bring it back into specification and then look at all those, all those possibilities along the way, you might actually find new phenomenon or new expressions that are going to actually be better than maybe not for the current product, but for some product down the road, or it becomes a next generation machine because you probe some variable and found that it was essential, but you only found it by failing uh, at first. So uh, when an artist is doing, uh, doing the, their work, uh, they are failing as they go as well. Uh, the, the, the important thing, in, you know, in life generally, right, is get back up. Uh, the, I've heard mastery in the arts, and I would say this for, for really for any discipline, that mastery in the arts isn't knowing how, how to do something, it's knowing how to fix it. Um, mm -hmm. That you, you have to just have tools to be able to steer back into, into the realm, but at the same time, understanding more and more about what it is that you're doing. Um, a lot of times with like with an artwork, the goal isn't necessarily traditional beauty. It's more about uh, building tension. It's having some sort of a dialogue in the work that that uh, forces the observer, the, the, the person interacting with the artwork to think about things. Um, <laughs> I've heard uh, it was, uh, art defined as uh, so a hack, someone who just, you know, just cranks stuff out. A hack caters to existing emotional needs. An artist seeks to create new emotional needs, so it's it's really putting putting something out there that's going to make you go, oh my gosh, wow, yeah, that is beautiful, but wow, right, kind of David Lynch style, <laughs> doc, uh, but provocation, right? It's it's not necessarily just to soothe you about, you know, the the beauty of the universe or the symmetry of a flower, but also then to then contemplate what does that mean. Uh, that it's symmetric am i doesn't matter um, so it's per, about much more about provocation as a uh, mm -hmm. as a specification which is not usually what you want in a machine but in a sense you 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 still have to go through that uh, that process of understanding mm -hmm. yeah it's interesting to see the parallels between what you were talking about like the upper and lower specification limits how um there's that with the process engineering and then that just reminded me of like when i was playing the violin in an orchestra um you're kind of like tuning your own instrument to work well with the rest of the yes. the quartet rest of the orchestra as well um and even when you're playing your own music you try and know if it doesn't sound right then you can adjust and it kind of ties back to what you were saying about fixing and adjusting. Yes. Yeah. We're always, we're always bounded in some way um, and understanding those boundary conditions and where, because that, that's where creativity comes in. Mm -hmm. uh, just sort of un, unbridled opportunity is sort of the worst, op, worst chance for invention. Uh, you're going to be much more inventive when you have restrictions in place uh, mm -hmm. that you have to, it's, it's forcing you to, uh, to you know, pinball off the sides of the problem. 
um, and, and really explore parts of, of the variable space that you wouldn't necessarily go to if all you were thinking about was uh, holding to, a, a, holding to a, a center line or center spec. Yeah, that's great, like connection between the two. Moving on, while there are many different types of art, most people usually think of paintings as the basically the greatest source of art. Um, and there's a unique history revolving around the use of polymers as vehicles for pigments used in paintings. So first, could you explain what you mean by a vehicle for polymers and how they work, as well as how the selection of polymers evolved over time in our paintings and how that's changed how paintings look today? Yeah, paint, yeah like I said, painting is uh, uh, sort of the go-to with this art. Oh, Mona Lisa, right? Or, <laughs> or mm -hmm. Botticelli or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, and then everybody says, well, I can't do that, so I'm not an artist, which is very sad. Uh, but th this idea that I have a visual field and I'm going to represent in a two-dimensional uh, plane what I'm seeing in a three-dimensional world, I mean, it goes back tens of thousands of years, right, to, to the, the early cave paintings. Um, and there the paintings either had no vehicle, no, no adhesive uh, binder uh, in them because the materials that were being used were sort of inherently, uh, had, had some, some inherent quality of stickiness. So like uh, mm -hmm. the powdered iron oxide that we call ochre, which is actually about the color of my jacket. Uh, that, that if you have finely ground up ochre, uh, it, uh, it actually sticks on your hands, it'll stick on the surface of, of a piece of rock. Same with carbon, you know, finely divided carbon, carbon black soot or something. That's very small particles, nanoparticles really, that then easily smear and, and have some physical and chemical adhesion to whatever you're putting it into. So they didn't really need a vehicle. Um, although there's some things like using chalk where the, uh, the painter would actually use saliva. And there, so that was kind of one of, maybe one of the first vehicles is you're then starting to have, use um, your body's natural proteins, uh, sugars, carbohydrates that are in your mouth, then form a, an organic poly based polymer that helps to hold things in place uh, in, for, for some period of time. Uh, that became more intentional, still sort of building upon the, uh, the naturally sourced materials. I mean, always, materials, material science is ultimately about rocks uh, that have been purified in different ways. Uh, so going, going back to just the purity uh, or, or whatever you could dig up or whatever maybe you could crush uh, that had the right colors or the right qualities and then beginning to mix that with different things to make it stick. And people were just noticed uh, over time that uh, certain, especially with food products, right? Whether it was like dairy products or eggs or fats um, or plant oils or plant materials. And di these different things with time changed, right? They, they evolved, they, maybe they lost water, maybe they, they cooked the proteins denatured in reaction with something else and made some sort of an adhesive. Uh, so things like uh, milk-based paints, casein-based paints uh, were some, uh, an early polymer that was used or, or egg yolks, tempera, using egg, egg whites and egg yolk as, as the protein binder for the material. And then also giving it the binder, but also conveyed with the idea of a vehicle is, is how it flows. Like how does it flow under the brush or under your finger or however? to give you certain effects, um, getting it to be able to stand up so you have more, uh, more relief in the, in the picture. Uh, so all those things kind of contributed to the development of, of what, how art looked because you were able to get it to adhere to different surfaces and give uh, different types of vehicles when they dry will give you a different amount of reflection. So different types of reflection, more, more uh, specular or more matte type of reflections which change the way that you perceive perceive it in different, uh, different environments. But the vehicle also gets in and, and sort of wraps itself around all these tiny particles and changes whether the particles themselves are able to scatter or if they're surrounded by something of a, a lower refractive index than they are, that then makes it so the colors become richer. You get less, you get more of a saturated color than you would uh, if it was just sort of adhered as, as a powder onto, onto a surface. So all these things then were, coming into the 20th century uh, with intentional polymer chemistry, it, mm -hmm. the, the game has always been to first mimic nature as you know, biomimetic. Here's, here, here's, here's my spit, here's my milk, here's my eggs. We know what that looks like. Give me something that does that because I like that, but I don't want it to yellow so fast. I don't want to be painting with my food, whatever. <laughs> uh, 
it, it, it becomes, or, or you go back to it. Some artists now, because you have those, those, those technical capabilities, sometimes mm-hmm. it, it's, it's fun or evocative. It actually becomes part of the art to use tech, use uh, natural materials as part of what you're doing. Like if you're trying to reduce your, uh, your microplastics footprint, for example, uh, moving away from acrylics, because every time you clean your brush, you're sending a whoosh of, uh, of acrylic acrylates into the, into the water system. Uh, so it's, th- th- there's opportunities there, certainly. It's, 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 mm. it's one of the most, fast, I, th- I think, a fascinating materials engineering story, both from the point of view of the vehicles and the pigments of how humans have uh, leveraged those things to, for, for, for expression in different ways. So for artists, are they almost required to have a class in all the different materials? Because like you're saying, all these different things, because they have different material properties, give different perceptions, whether it's more saturated or more reflective or et cetera. So how is that normalized across art? And I guess, is it something that is beyond a lot of people and only the masters truly understand everything and how it works together as a material system? Well, go back to what I said about, going back to what I said about the materials engineering or engineering versus science, right? Mm-hmm. Um, in, in, in the investigative way, it's important to know what sort of precision is available so you can then intentionally dial back your precision so that you have the, the accuracy that's only the accuracy that's necessary. Um, from the point of view of, of an artist who maybe they can go to the, to the local art store and buy a tube of paint uh, they mm-hmm. don't need to know really anything about the chemistry of what they're using because um, someone's already figured it out for them. So from the point of view of, of how they use their time, how they use their resources, they don't need to know that someone's done that for them and they can then go deep dive into the, the, what they really want to be doing, which is experimenting with expression, right? Mm-hmm. So that's been a, a, a great gift to the arts and that they can then go farther because they don't have, they aren't sitting there with a, a mortar and pestle and, and just, you know, sort of additively putting additional amounts of either yolk or white into their tempera as they're, as they're, as they're dealing with it. Um, some artists like to do that. They like that level of control. They, lo- they want that precision to be a part of how they think about their material. And, for some people that gives them additional level of sensitivity to the material and, and uh, uh, the way that they might work the material, it's, it's going to, it's, you're gonna see that all oh, this, they, I think they made their own paints here. This is that blue, you just can't buy that blue, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so the, it, it, it's, it's very much about this doing what's absolute, doing what's necessary and finding ways forward, whether you have the, the empirical, the scientific knowledge, I should say, whether, whether you have that deep dive into, you know, the, the lengths of your chains and whatnot, and the rheology and non-Newtonian viscosities or whatever, that isn't necessary to know that to that precision in order to be a painter, uh, to be an artist. If you do know it, you might be able to do something that's going to be different and unique, but it's absolutely not necessary any more than it's necessary for if a, if a material scientist buys a a bottle of alumina from Alpha Asar. They don't need to know how alpha, how they don't need to know the sourcing <laughs> of the alpha aluminum oxide. Uh, it's just that it's going into my it's going into my ceramic. That's all I need to know. I trust mm. I trust the upstream to have provided me with something that is uh, low risk and uh, well understood. Right, right. No, that's fascinating, and I'm excited to talk about the potential or the future of the space, especially as it pertains to Vanta Black, which we'll get into later in this episode. Um, but right now I want to touch on glass blowing because that's been fascinating to me ever since I went to Italy, went to see the Murano glass blowing, um, I guess, shop um, in Venice. And it was evident that this process isn't something that was perfected, refined overnight, probably took years and years, hundreds of years, thousands of years, I don't even know. Um, But it's clear there's a lot of materials engineering that comes into play. And so I was just wondering if you could explain uh, what glass blowing is and maybe talk through some of the physics and chemistry concepts that come into play here. Yeah, so glass blowing is is kind of the, it's it's kind of the sexiest way of making things out of glass, but glass has been uh, formed by humans 
for actually for over a million years, some of the earliest uh, shaped artifacts actually weren't even made by humans. They were made by uh, Homo habilis that made from obsidian, natural occurring glass, because of what glass does, which is the particular type of conchoidal fracture, the way it breaks gives you the very sharp edges. Plus you get the, the look of, the, of that, that glassy look. Um, so it was both aesthetic and useful uh, for, except for a million years or more. Um, humans only began to intentionally make glassy materials uh, probably about five or 6,000 years ago uh, when they've mastered fire enough to get things hot enough to actually make molten silicates uh, first um, in, in sort of in small forms or as a coating on, on ceramics, but then uh, figuring out finally to make, uh, make the, the goo that you could then shape and that would stay shapeable for a while and would have these, this wonderful range of, of color expression. Um, but that, so that was like about 1500 BC, roughly, that the Mesopotamian, Mesopotamians and the e Egyptians came up with a glass material that they were actually making things out of. But it wasn't, it was 1500 years until about a, a hot 50 or 100 BC that someone actually blew glass. Until then, it was always made uh, either by some sort of a casting process or by pressing it into a mold, and then often grinding out the center. If you actually wanted a hollow form, you either had to go and grind it out, or you had to sort of dip, like, like dipping a, an ice cream into, a, into the chocolate, you would make a, a film of, gla of the glass on the outside, and then you dig out the insides. But at some point, in a, like I said, about 100, uh, 100 BCE, somebody, and we don't know who, we don't know exactly where, we don't know why, uh, someone looked at a bubble in glass and said, oh, it's, the vessel is already almost there. I just need to create the bubble within. How could I do that? Well, I can blow into a straw or into a tube, make a bubble of air, and there it would be. Um, and that was really the beginning of, of glass manufacturing writ large. I mean, where you went from very few artifacts found in the world to hundreds of thousands of bottles throughout the Roman Empire and beyond that were made by this this process. So once people saw it, there was, a, this, again, the materials engineering, there was a need, it felt, there was an opportunity, and there was a technology and a material, and it just, you know, it was the first big thing. And uh, people figured out pretty quickly how to use the material in that way to make bottles uh, or vessels or bowls or cups or uh, various things. Um, and essentially what what uh, a glass blower does today is almost identical to what the Romans were doing 2000 years ago. Um, it's, it's actually ast astonishing to look at a Roman bottle and see the delicacy of the decoration and the symmetry and the, the design of the form. Uh, there's, uh, th they were doing what we, what we do now uh, with much cruder uh, implement, implements, um, maybe not quite as, uh, with, with as much success, uh, but it certainly was all happening then. Uh, now your blowpipes are stainless steel instead of uh, instead of iron, or the uh, or and, and the colors are far more vibrant, and, and range of colors are available because of inorganic chemistry understanding. But overall, it's still uh, glass blowing is is not that different. A, a Roman, if a Roman walked into a modern day hot shop, they would know what's going on. They would pick up a blowpipe, take a gather, and start working. It, wow. it wouldn't be very long at all. Yeah. I think yes. the underlying principles are so are, are so robust in terms of the coupling of viscosity and heat transfer um, and the materials reactions that uh, it once once you figured it out, you don't really want to change it that much because uh, glass is a cliff. It, it's you're either right or you're wrong, and uh, mm -hmm. people by failing <laughs> learned. <laughs> learned what the, where those formulations were, uh, what was necessary for cooling it down slowly and kneeling the glass, uh, mm -hmm. what sort of changes you made to the composition and how that would change thermal expansion compatibility or durability in water, uh, fracture toughness, all those sorts of things that would be very much, uh, you know, the very underlying uh, materials engineering principles. That's it. On the topic of glass, and you briefly mentioned this before, but the idea of stained glass how is that different I and mean, what different processing steps does it have to get through to go from the glass that is clear or like one color to this beautiful finish where there's all these different types of colors? 
Yeah, so stained glass is interesting. It's sort of the opposite in some ways of the hot glass forming, right? Which is this sexy, dynamic, uh, athletic almost <laughs> activity to something as sedate as sort of sitting at a table in your, in your basement and slowly cracking the glass, breaking the glass into different in, into the right size pieces. Um, of course, at some point, all the stained glass, in order to get into thin sheets, someone had to work it. So it was melted. It was shaped by some method, either by hand or by machine. Uh, sometimes the, the, the glass itself was colored uh, there, with certain colors that are very bright, vibrant, that are easy to make in the glass, things like cobalt blue, or, or for example. Um, mm. But other, other colors in the glass are actually applied afterwards, so they're painted on. Uh, but there, now we're back to painting, and now <laughs> thinking about, well, what sort of pigments would I use? What sort of vehicles would I use in order to apply things to the glass? And that uh, becomes this whole other area of... of of experimentation, uh, some stained glass painting is actually fired on. So you actually paint with enamels and then you bring mm. it back up to four or 500 degrees C, let the enamels, let the vehicle burn out, let the enamels melt and, and fuse into the glass. Uh, but other times it, it, they're just, they're painted on and uh, with, a, with some sort of a water durable or light durable uh, adhesive as a part of the powder in order to get the, get the colors. But to me, one of the most fascinating things about watching a stained glass artist work is actually watching them break the glass, watching them cut it into, you know, these sinuous lines and then going in and, and just running the crack exactly where they want it to be. Uh, so that the, the break, the way glass breaks, I mean, going, going back to Homo habilis, the way that glass breaks is as fantastic and as um, important and intentional from both the materials side and the art side. Um, as how you work it when it's when it's uh, molten, uh, it's still something the glass does uniquely well that humans, whether arts artists or engineers, have learned to leverage. You mentioned like the enamel and how that's incorporated into the system, so that just made me wonder. I guess how much work is being put into uh, art systems where there's multiple different types of materials that come into play? How is that figured out? Yeah, uh, it's <laughs> trial and error. Often. <laughs> Uh, Seems to be a theme here. <laughs> I'm paying attention, right? That's that's the heart of experimental design. Uh, a lot of it has just been, it's, it's sort of handed down that people know that, or people have come to know that uh, if, if these two things go together, then they'll stay together. And if we don't, then these will break apart. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things that I've tried to do in my, in the classes that I teach to artists particularly, is uh, teaching them mixed media, what they call mixed media approaches to hot glass and how to, uh, what's the science behind when metal and glass will stick together or metals and ceramics or enamels will stick together and how to, how to anticipate that. Um, and also to how to anticipate when it's not going to work but it's still gonna look really cool when it breaks. And that that actually can be a new way of, uh, that, that what, what an engineer would think of as a failure mode uh, the artist can actually see as a really cool way to make a certain texture or to make some sort of a comment about, say, the fragility of, of humans, the fragility of nature uh, in the, in, in, by cr intentionally creating a particular kind of broken surface because mm -hmm. of incompatibility, because of chemical reactions gone crazy. Uh, there's, always, there's, there's lots of interesting opportunities in those things. When we look at large pieces of stained glass, like in cathedrals in Europe that are like, I don't know, like 20, 30 feet high and multiple feet wide, how long does that take? Is there any sort of time frame? Because I would assume you have to blow or you would have to make each piece and paint it and then have somehow assemble it either on site or off site. That seems like a ginormous task, even for the like the medieval ages as well. Do we have like any sort of time frame for that? Typically, again, the, this is another like with glass blowing. A lot of the methods that are used by contemporary stained glass artists are essentially the same as they were using. Uh, the, the materials might be a little more pure. They've got a little mm -hmm. bit better in terms of uh, uh, the, 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 you know, the the toughness of the tooling, but they're still using lead and copper and solders and and things to and, and the glass is still the glass. Um, and so, so it, it might take. Uh, a stained glass artist to, to doing a large commission. It might take several years of working on it uh, or a team with a team of artists working on it uh, over a period of time. You might have, because some, some operations you need to, to 
set it and let it dry, right? Then you come back to it, but you might, so you might have something else going on. But it takes, it, it's, a, it's a laborious uh, and intense uh, process that can go on for a very long time. Uh, there's a, a there's a, an art an art center out of uh, in Los Angeles called Judson Studios that has uh, re, that has been making stained glass art in the United States for over a hundred years, but they've recently begun to incorporate some more modern tools so that they can make larger pieces of glass that have imagery on them, and then figuring out how to incorporate that. That's been kind of one of the big step forward for glass art in the last or for, for stained glass art in, in centuries, I would say. Wow, that's fascinating. Um, but yeah, we've covered uh, quite a few uses of polymers and glasses so far. So now I wanna dive into um, when and why metals are selected to send a message through art. Um, so in the context of maybe, let's say the Statue of Liberty with copper or the charging bull on Wall Street, which is a bronze statue, um, how are these, or what does the processing look like for um, these pieces of art and what makes metals the uh, apt choice in these types of situations? So we, metals are, the different metals are chosen not only up, uh, how they're formed and how they're going to appear um, and how they've appeared historically, but also how they're going to change when they're actually, actually put into their service environment. And so this gets into the issue of, of oxidation, corrosion, or the artists call patination or building up of the patina that where the, the you're not actually going to see the metal. Uh, and because I mean, on earth, metal doesn't happen very often. It's a very, uh, we, we've got a lot of oxygen around and most metals like to react with oxygen and, and other things. So it, you, by anticipating how these, how the material system is going to evolve in service uh, and doing with intentional intentionality, then you can, build that into the work. So with the, like the Statue of Liberty being made out of copper, the goal wasn't to have a copper colored Statue of Liberty because they knew that it was going to be out in, uh, out in you know, New York Harbor. So it was, going to, it was going to oxidize. And so the color that the, sort of the greenish blue that uh, azure um, color is because of the mix, mix of different copper oxides and carbonates and things that now make up the patina of the Statue of Liberty that actually help protect the surface once you have an intact patina. It's not the same as say aluminum passivating or aluminum oxide passivating alumina or chrome, mm -hmm. uh, chrome oxide on chrome, but it is still, uh, it, it helps slow things, can slow things down. Uh, similarly, bronze with uh, the, the, the bull on Wall Street, uh, the bronze look of bronze is actually the look of a, an intentionally rusted, well, it, rust is usually uh, held back for specifically for iron alloys, but uh, specifically oxidized and treated so that it has that that dark umber uh, appearance that is uh, that denotes sort of strength and durability. Yeah, I, I never really knew. I knew that it was a copper color when it came to America, the Statue of Liberty was, but I didn't know that France intentionally made it so that it would uh, oxidize over time and change colors. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, for whatever reason, I just thought it was a mistake. <laughs> uh, Didn't they know it was going to rust? <laughs> like, yeah. Like, no, they, they knew where it was going. It wasn't the first thing made people I mean, they, they had been making stuff out of copper for 4,000 years. So, <laughs> yeah, I guess to be fair, I didn't really think about it that much uh, about the logistics of uh, they sent this like 60 foot tower, and like, nope, it's going to stay like this forever. <laughs> uh, but another interesting idea is that. We talked about it was in the harbor so they knew the environment they knew how it was going to react over time and they thought about that throughout their planning and yes. so another thing that you talked about was having art in space which is now a new frontier of where we can put things and the form can now completely change because of like the lack of gravity for example uh and the idea that we could tell a story of humans as an extra planetary civilization could you yeah. talk about this idea further and kind of how do we do this in a uh, like a logistical manner? Because it seems very hard to get anything up into space right now. Well, the good news is that it's, it's getting easier. Uh, yeah. I think in the last, uh, well, last five years, really, and really it's, it's, it's accelerating uh, mm -hmm. right now. Uh, the, the, the commercial uh, building, building in space with, with rockets and soon uh, space stations NASA just announced uh, a grant, a funding for three 
companies that are going to be building uh, commercial space space stations for whatever needs to be done uh, after the ISS is uh, decommissioned. So it, it's happening and, uh, and people are thinking about it. People are thinking about uh, the, that cultural side of it in, in addition to uh, how does it enable you know, manufacturing of different things because if you don't have gravity, you don't, for example, you don't have buoyancy. Um, and so if you have a temperature variation in a molten system uh, and you don't have buoyancy, then you don't have the sort of cells and mixing and which can lead to phase separation and all sorts of things that can mess up. But if you, if you, know, if you do it right, you can actually then make things that are actually sensitive to those situations and, and fabricate materials that are impossible to make on Earth. Uh, because you're making them in zero gravity. And if that has enough of a, of a cost advantage, then you know, people will want it. Um, from the art side, we're just beginning to uh, uh, kind of understand what is going to, what's going to bring value, right? It's still going to cost a lot of money. So what are people willing to pay for in the early years of, of the human, humans off planet? Um, and what is going to be, again, to this aesthetic spec, what is going to be evocative, right? What's going to really uniquely communicate about the human condition that is worth making in these extraordinary environments, currently extraordinary. Um, it's, it's a whole other type of, of pioneering, right? In the same way that there are material scientists and engineers who are working on these high value optical materials or uh, electronic materials or biochemical, uh, bio, biochemical materials that can only be made in low gravity. Um, beginning to think about either both sort of repurposing existing methods. So how do, how are paint vehicles going to change, right? Are you, but are you actually, is it going to be important to be painting on a flat surface in space? Um, or because you, it, instead of, I mean, we have a plane on a wall and we're standing in gravity. And so we then address that, that surface in front of us. What if you could address all the surfaces and you're sort of floating around your canvas um, in space. And uh, it, it becomes a different exercise, right? Now suddenly painting in the round or in the sphere is, it becomes a, a more, more feasible. You're not going to, you're not sitting there having to spin it around. You just sort of move around it. And what sort of looks, what kind of gestures are, are more appropriate for that type of way of working? Uh, it's, it's kind of, I think the process is sort of started with the computer, digital painting, like painting on your computer and the beginning of people painting and sculpting in, with uh, uh, with um, 3D goggles on. So, so you're actually creating three-dimensional forms with your hands that then are remembered by the computer so you can make a virtual sculpture uh, mm. of forms that you couldn't make if you were trying to squish it into a piece of clay or carve it into a piece of wax or stone. And then you can 3D print that if you want to, or it can always live as a, as, as a virtual piece of sculpture. So extending that, uh, that ability of the human mind to come up with metaphor, right? To, to think about, well, this is, this is the idea that I've got. Here's a new medium. Here's a new, new toy of way to, to explore uh, that, that idea. People will figure it out. I have no idea what space art is going to look like, but I cannot wait to see it. <laughs> yeah, it just ties back to that same theme of trial and error. That, that's what it'll take to, uh, figure this out, quote unquote. Yeah, and it's gonna take materials engineers and scientists to help it out, uh, to, to make it happen efficiently, but also it has to happen safely. And so people who are working on, uh, you know, aerospace engineers working on user interface design and, and safety protocols for, uh, for, for currently for space stations and then ultimately for say uh, moon bases and Mars bases, there's gonna be very particular things that you cannot do, right? You're not mm -hmm. gonna be blowing glass on a space station gathering from a hot molten furnace. You're not going to have a torch uh, on, for probably on a space station for a very long time uh, for good reason. So what, what does glass blowing on a space station look like? What are you gonna be making? Why are you going to be making it there? All these great critical questions of, of what justifies the risk um, for the expression that's ultimately made. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, as I said, it's very exciting to think about how humans are going to negotiate that and what's going to be created.
Yeah. All questions that I don't have the answer to, but I also look forward to hearing. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, we talked about uh, Vanta Black before we briefly mentioned it, um, but it's a topic I want to discuss because it utilizes advanced materials uh, like nanotubes to take color to a whole new level. Um, and I read online that it, it absorbs 99.965% of visible light to create one of the, if not the darkest pigment. Um, and so on a high level, can you just explain um, the material science that uh, like make up this pigment and what this can lead to with the future of art? Yeah, uh, it, it's, it's really an interesting opportunity because uh, the, it's, it's this intersection between uh, some of the newest type of materials uh, that have been developed, that is the carbon nanotube, or which you know, based on the fullerene structure, uh, like buckyballs that wasn't even, that was only discovered, I guess, in the late 80s, um, and has led then to this uh, a completely new appearance that, that, that humans had never, people had imagined, well, they'd imagined it on, uh, I, like on oh, cartoons where you have like the hole that nobody can tell that it's not a hole, it's just a piece of plastic on the, on the and, and then mm -hmm. the, the, somehow the coyote falls in. <laughs> um, it's that level of blackness when you see it, it it's like you cannot believe your eyes your your evolution will look at that and think that it has to be there can't be anything there it, it's negative it, it's it's a, it, it's not that it's just a black surface it's like there's nothing there and and so that level of of sort of this dysphoria that it induces you know back to that idea that our, our, the the duty of art is to create new emotional needs that you know, presenting the human mind with that with that paradox is uh, is startling and and makes you sort of step back and, and think about what you're seeing and think about everything that you see then in a new way. So the the the, the manufacture of the uh, of the nanotubes is done by uh, you know, controlled pyrolysis in very very specific atmospheres and very specific type of flame that you generate the carbons and then the carbons wrap around themselves into this uh, C60 or C and structure uh, going out in all directions. But so you end up with carbon, which is this uh, you know, semiconducting material that mm -hmm. then absorbs the light, absorbs all the photons that come into it. And when they're relatively well aligned, the light just goes in, bounces, and never can get back out, right? It's not like bouncing off a surface. It actually sort of bounces in and then plays around in this forest of nanotubes and gets lost. And so it's very rare for some, anything to, to find its way out sort of the black hole of, of uh, quantum mechanics. And, and so that, that type of, of surface that, that, or that can be created by painting these onto, the, onto a surface, uh, these vertically aligned nanotubes, uh, then creates this, this optical effect that's extraordinary. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's just mind blowing, I guess, thinking about that. I guess it just reminds me of, uh, optical illusions in a point and maybe seeing how that could play a factor into the future of art and just playing with our eyes and playing with our mind too. Oh yeah. You know, that, that I think, well, we're seeing a lot of that, I think with, uh, as artists began to explore three-dimensional, uh, virtual reality type of scenarios, right. There, there, there's a trick that's being done there that is based in the materials that it's built around, but also on the computing power to create simulations of things that would be uh, physically impossible to make, uh, mm -hmm. but by understanding the, the neurology neuro of, of, of human vision and vision perception and, and oral perception as well, you can create these new environments um, in different ways. So it's, it's, it's kind of beyond, we, we've talked mostly about sort of the made world, right, of, of art mm -hmm. as object. Uh, but art as performance and art as experience is also going to have a revolution that, uh, that the, uh, I think the Vanta Black is a nice sort of bridge for that, uh, creating uh, these new, new types of human experiences, whether it's in music, uh, uh, in performance, in visual uh, sensation, tactile, I mean, people beginning to have tactile suits so that you can actually stimulate other parts of the body, simulating chemistry so you can have olfactory. I mean, all, all these different ways of immersing the human or, or communicating ideas into the human receptive systems, uh, materials will be there uh, enabling it, whether you directly or indirectly. Yeah, I just like to think of it almost like 3D printing where 
we have additive and subtractive. And I feel like in art, we focus on so much of the additive, adding colors, mixing colors. But now with Vantablack, we kind of have the option to take away. And so I can only imagine what artists can figure out how to use this in an intriguing way where they make some painting and they start taking away parts by just painting over it with Vantablack and just seeing how that can create new illusions. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, today we uncover just how deep the intersection between MSc and art really is uh, and how all material classes uh, can be incorporated in the space. I know that I've personally been lacking in my art history as I thought that France made a mistake with the uh, <laughs> Statue of Liberty. So we definitely could use some more art history. Uh, but considering everything we discussed today, what advice would you give to materials engineers who are interested in getting into this art field and learning more about it or even potentially, like you said, creating the intersection between the two? Take an art history class. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. It's a little late for me, but uh, I'll definitely tell that to everybody <laughs> no, else. It's never, never too late to learn, believe me. <laughs> um, I think that I mean, there's sort of the formal and the informal, I would guess, I would say. I mean, certainly if like for a, for a freshman who might be watching this and for getting ready to go to college, uh, try to, try to uh, if, if it works for your, for your budget and your needs to find an institution that values um, uh, a liberal arts education alongside of an engineering and sciences education um, to the extent that's possible or in a location that even if it's not happening on campus, you can uh, be involved in the art scene wherever it is that you're going. Uh, if you can, uh, you'll have electives uh, along the way. Think about electives that aren't just sort of the, the throwaway, well, I've got to take an English class, so I'll just take English Lit. You know, 20th century English lit. Think about it a little bit. Maybe talk. Go go talk to the professors and say, "Hey, I'm a material scientist. I'm interested in uh, the broader use of materials and culture. Are there any classes that I could take? Maybe they're 300 level. Maybe they're 400 level. That would be uh, maybe a, a chance to explore that. You might even be, find yourself in a really cool um, uh, uh, independent study because the, the, the professors could be could be interested in enabling that sort of thing. So. Get out there and, and you, you kind of have to fight for it in some places and or, or dig it up. And, and I encourage to do that as part of like your education and then dovetailing that where you can into your, into your uh, science and engineering education. But the other thing is uh, on your own, whether you think, think of yourself as an artist or as a musician or a performer, keep those parts of yourself alive, um, nurture them while you are also nurturing your science nerd and uh, look for opportunities to get to, for those crossover points. Uh, because uh, down the road, what's gonna be valued by your employer um, is, very, is very likely going to be more than just whether or not you, know, you, can, you can calculate a band structure. They're gonna wanna know that you're creative. They're gonna wanna know that you're social, a social human who can uh, be a good part of a team and, and a decent human being. And uh, the arts provide you with an opportunity for that type of development as well. So like, e even if it's not about, yeah, the, the, the patina on the, on, the, on the Statue of Liberty, um, at the very least, it's about um, just being a whole person uh, in all the ways that people are people. Right. Yeah, you're unlocking new ways to think. And that's what employers seek is that creativity when you're problem solving. So I, yeah, I couldn't have said it better myself. And I just wanted to thank you, Jane, for coming on to the show today. Um, it was a pleasure having you. My pleasure, guys. This is great. Good luck. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the It's a Material World podcast. If you enjoyed the show, consider subscribing, hitting the like button down below, and commenting what topics and guests you'd like to see next. To download our free career development guide for MSCs, check out the link in the description. We'll see you soon, and in the meantime, go change the world. <laughs>